So I know that because the time is so uh, tight. So we have to start on time. Yeah. Hello, good morning. Yeah, Lisa. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for all of you to join this uh, webinar. Uh, this is the second webinar uh, oversee section. So soon we will have uh, one uh, for local section. So this time the webinar, uh, the topic is communication mechanisms between institutions. Okay, so we are very, very honored to invite three speakers. They are really uh, done a great job and work on this area. Yeah, so this is the rundown. Uh, as usual, uh, I will have an introduction first. Okay, so and then presentation and Q&A. Uh, because the tight schedule, I think we will leave the Q&A at the end, but uh, you can post your question in the chat box. So just in case uh, you don't know our project. Okay, so uh, this is a UGC funded teaching and learning project. Uh, the title is Enriching Senior Year Place Students. So in Hong Kong, we call Senior Year Place Students. In US or in the literature, we call Vertical Transfer Students. So we, our project's aim is enriching those uh, Vertical Transfer Students' learning experience through curricular and also curricular activity in Hong Kong's university. So this project involves four universities, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, CTU, and also Baptist U and also Chinese University of Hong Kong. Yeah, so three university. Okay. So now may I uh, uh, introduce, okay, our very honored speakers. Okay, so we have uh, three speakers. The first is Dr. Uh, Eileen Strample. So Dr. Eileen Strample is the inaugural dean, UCLA Herb Albert School of Music. So she is a national recognized transfer champion. She has a mixed tremendous effort connecting UCLA School of Music with a community college in LA regions uh, for the institutional credit transfer agreements. And also her commitment to transfer students also extends nationally at National Institute for the Study of Transfer Students and American Council on Education. She also co-author with our first webinar speaker, Dr. Stephen Handel, to have a publication focusing on higher education, public policy entitled Beyond Free College, Making High Education Work for 21st Century Students. This work follows their co-edit two volume set transfer and transformation, fostering transfer student success published in 2016 and also 2018. So it's really our honor to have Dr. Irene Strample and also Dr. Steve Handel to be our speakers today. So I would like also in, uh, introduce our second speaker, Ms. Rose House. She is the director of Workforce Strategies, Mary Copa, Community College, Arizona. She has established Maricopa as a national leader in transfer student by creating a university partnership model adapted by community college systems across the country. Rose has a great leadership related to strategy, design, and execution of a academic and workforce solution. In her current role, she leads the district's workforce initiatives, which includes power learning assessment, competency-based education, and also micro credentialing while keeping transfer on the forefront. And Rose has a long history and experience, 25 years in <laughs> higher education and was a recipient of the National Institute for the Study of a Transfer Students Transfer Champion Award and was recently named one of the 10 national leaders accepted into the 2021 Designers in Residence Program with the Education Design Lab located in Washington, DC. 
what a great achievement. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. So it's really our honor to have our host to be our speaker. And Dr. Stephen Handel, okay, our old friend, and also our first uh, webinar speaker uh, for overseas sections. Uh, he is the Executive Director, Strategic High Education Assessment Use and Opportunity, the College Board. As I mentioned before, uh, he co authored with the ILEAD, okay, with a few publications. And uh, Dr. Handel also has a very long uh, experience. Okay, he has over 30 of, uh, years of experience in the higher education sector. In his uh, current capacity with the college board, he consulted with education leaders nationally and internationally in the formation of uh, strat strategies that boost student success in higher education. Prior to his position, he served as a uh, associate vice president, undergraduate admissions for the University of California, UC system. And as UC's first director of a community college transfer enrollment planning, where he initiated strategic enrollment policies, focusing on the needs of the community college transfer students. So with all this, uh, credentials, you can see that I think we're all looking forward to their sharing and that we can learn for our local uh, establishment of the communi communication mechanism between institutions. So, um, so right now, may I invite uh, Dr. Handel to, to start with uh, about this uh, webinar. Wonderful, so, thanks, Steve. Ken. Thank you, Ken, so much. That was very kind and a lovely, lovely introduction. Thank you. It's great to be here again with many of you. Um, uh, I don't want to take too much time because you're in for a real treat tonight. These are a couple of colleagues from my, uh, from uh, from whom I've worked for a number of years on this very issue: building strong, successful transfer ecosystems, and why communication is so important. And here's the key: the key here is we have a representative from the American Community College. College system, that would be Rose, and then from the American University system, and that would be Eileen. Having said that, they both understand both two and four year institutions so very, very well. And they're really going to focus in on sort of the key best practices that these kinds of colleges and universities need to implement in order to serve transfer students well. Um, and so I don't want to take too much time uh, now because what we're going to do is I'm going to have Rose begin and she's going to sort of set the stage uh, from her position as a community college expert. And then she's going to hand it over to Eileen, who will speak from her perspective um, from a four year uh, college in California. We're then gonna to come together, hopefully uh, about maybe, uh, well, at least our time, 7.35, I'm talking from beautiful California right here. Um, mm -hmm. And then we're gonna talk for five or 10 minutes, um, sort of emphasizing some of the issues that they've raised in their talk. And then finally, we're gonna to go to you with your questions. So as you think about uh, some of the issues we raise here, uh, think about the questions you'd like to ask. One additional thing before I turn it over, um, we've got a lot of information to impart to you. Um, these slides are jam packed full of information and we're not gonna be able to go through each one chapter and verse, but we are gonna send this slide deck to you. So we thought we would err on the side of more information rather than less. And we know we will go through these slides rather quickly, um, but we'll have time for Q and A and then we'll also uh, uh, send these slides to you. And there'll also be an opportunity for us to email and maybe talk further. So with that, I don't want to take up any more time. I want to throw it over to Rose. Um, mm -hmm. Can we move to the next slide? I don't think I have control of the slides right now. Um, so I'm going to ask someone to move, the, move to the next slide, if you would. And there's our beautiful faces. Well, at least they're, <laughs> they're beautiful yeah. faces. Um, <laughs> and then we'll go to the next slide. So Rose, I think the slide after that, and then we'll get Rose started. And Rose, just indicate uh, what slide, how you'd like to advance the slides, and we'll go okay. from there. Uh, yeah, we'll go ahead to the next one, please. Okay. So um, before we begin, I just wanted to share a little bit more information about the Maricopa Community Colleges so that we can put this into perspective. Um, the Maricopa Community Colleges consist of 
10 independently accredited colleges underneath our district office. We have two skill centers who are primarily focused on occupational programs. And we also have a corporate college who offers non-credit workforce training. With that said, um, in terms of our number of enrollments, this is just a snapshot. We have close to 100,000 students per academic year. Out of those students, we typically have anywhere from 35% to maybe about 40% who indicate that they're going to our colleges intending to transfer to a university. Uh, the majority of the students that we do see indicate that they're really there to um, upskill, maybe retool, recareer, or, or get a better job. Um, but for the Maricopa Community Colleges, we pretty much treat every student like a transfer student because we know that um, more education um, whether it's right now or in the future is um, really important for that career ladder. So we really try to instill transfer mindedness with our student population. Our top feeder institutions are our three public universities, Arizona State, uh, Northern Arizona University, and the University of Arizona. We have about 7,000 students who tra um, transfer annually uh, to these three universities. And then we also have other transfer partners and we'll get into a little bit more of who they are and how many um, partnerships we have. Um, this is to give you an idea of how we're um, structured in Arizona. There are other community college districts uh, throughout the state. Um, again, those are our three public universities. And we are fortunate enough to have um, 20 years and standing a Arizona transfer model. So this has been in existence for over two decades and it's supported by statewide staff who helps us in terms of maintaining our partnerships with our three public universities. Next. So I'm just providing you with some brief information because I think it's important to stress that in order for us to have effective successful communication, you need to have the infrastructure and the structure in place to be able to support that communication. So when we are talking about transfer, we have various transfer models in place. Um, we have the two plus two, which is two years at the community college and then two years at the university. We have 75 credits where a student can stay at the community college a little longer and transfer more credits. That's a pretty cost-effective um, pathway. And then Maricopa actually has three plus ones. So this is um, pretty unique to Arizona, but it is um, gaining popularity uh, throughout the United States where a student can actually take 90 credits at the community college, paying community college prices and tuition, and then they would only need to take 30 credits at the university. We also have concurrent enrollment where they're duly enrolled both at the community college and the university as well as reverse transfer. And that's gaining in popularity nationally in terms of utilizing university transfer credit to complete associate degree and uh, certificate. Next. So this is a lot of information. So I'm just going to really kind of hit on some highlights. Um, like I said, in order for us to be effective in supporting our transfer partnerships, I would stress that it's important to have the organization. Um, for us, because we're a large urban community college in the United States, we get contacted a lot by universities who wanna develop partnerships with us. So it was important for us to be able to manage our resources by um, limiting the services we had for each partnership. So we determine in terms of who will get the signature level, who gets the premium level, and then who gets the standard level. And that's all based off on student enrollment. We really wanna make sure that we're supporting partnerships where our students are transferring. So to give you an example, the three public universities in our state, they're all our signature partners. And so we dedicate a lot of time and resources um, you could see some of the services that we provide uh, to our three public universities um, in, in terms of supporting our transfer arrangements. Next. 
So in terms of communication, how do we set those conditions for success, successful implementation and communication? So institution to institution, we work with our university partners in providing them with opportunities to meet with students. So that could be done through transfer fairs. It could be general. Um, we at one time could have 55 universities on a college campus meeting with transfer students. Um, we also provide discipline or major specific days like an allied health day, nursing, um, to make sure that those students who know what they want to major in and fairly know what university they want to go to have the opportunity to meet with those universities. In addition, we have a student success conference where we invite our university partners to meet with employees and faculty, as well as student service personnel, um, so that they have the necessary information um, that they need to advise transfer students. We also work with our university partners on joint marketing, collateral, and materials um, so that the joint messages, the shared messages that we want to send to students are co-designed and co-created by both institutions. We also have other publications like newsletter and transfer guides, as well as um, we work with a local newspaper um, to do um, quarterly publications so that we could reach a broader population of students who are interested or maybe thinking about um, attending a university. And then we also host yearly meetings to bring together faculty advisors and admissions. Next slide. So institution to students, how do we communicate to prospective learners what we have related to transfer? Well, we start in the high school. We wanna make sure that high school students are equipped in terms of what they need to know in order to make informed decisions. So it starts by creating clear and coherent pathways from the high school to the community college so that we could support their transition and their success here at Maricopa and then really prepare them to enter the university. We also align our courses. We offer dual enrollment in the high school. So these are Maricopa courses that high school students can take while they're in their secondary experience and get college credit. So we're doing a better job at preparing students to select those courses based on their majors. Um, so ultimately that could be maximized at the university. We are building in successful milestones and critical touch points. And then also we're working with the high schools to leverage prior learning assessment. Prior learning assessment is any learning that takes place outside the traditional classroom. So this could be military credit, standardized exams like AP and CLEP. Um, it could also mean certificates uh, that may be issued through an employer like Google um, issued certifications. Uh, so we really want to create the processes to be able to intake that learning so that we could onboard students onto guided pathways. And then we're also working with our university partners to stack and weave industry micro credentials and any other type of credentials that our students are bringing to the table. Um, so we really wanna leverage that prior learning so that students do not have to repeat competencies that they've already learned. Next slide. Um, other strategies that we're using for prospective learners is that we're changing our policies to be able to maximize more transfer credit, as well as credit that's earned through prior learning assessment. Um, so really um, building upon those learning experiences so that our students have a seamless um, journey with us. And then we're advising them accordingly, aligning it with what their university majors are so that they can have a successful transition to whatever university that they choose. And then we're also looking at our business processes to see how we could do this efficiently, effectively, and in a timely responsive manner. I think that that's very important in order to have these structures in place to be able to do this in a timely fashion because students are having to make decisions um, based off of 
um, course offerings, course taking, and then ultimately advising them on their transfer destination. Again, I know that this is a lot of information, um, but this is just to give you a snapshot of what we do to offer current learners. So in each of these steps, we have um, advisors and student services personnel um, relaying transfer options and messages. So during the advisement process, obviously the advisors are working with students on their transfer plans. We have new student orientation. That's our first opportunity to introduce university transfer to students. So even though they may not decide on whether or not they're a transfer student, this will give them exposure to all of the opportunities they have as part of their experience with the Maricopa Community Colleges. We have nine fields of interest. So this is our way of really narrowing down the choices for transfer students. So if you could just think of it as nine buckets. Um, within those nine buckets are majors, but it's a way for students to begin narrowing down their choices in their majors because it could be overwhelming for a student. Uh, you may have a student who might be a psychology major on day one, but then they find out about our artificial intelligence program and then they may switch majors um, based off of information that's shared with them. And then ultimately in our curriculum and our transfer pathways, those transfer milestones, messages, uh, we're building in micro transfer scholarships as part of our partnerships. And then as I indicated before, we do have a reverse transfer program that we offer students. Next. And then this is faculty to faculty conversations. We have internal groups. We have a statewide articulation task force group, groups. And then as part of our arrangements with Arizona State University, since they're our biggest feeder institution, we actually have faculty who sit on their curriculum committees and their general studies committees. So these faculty are fully participating as if they were one of ASU's faculty members on these committees. And then these Maricopa representatives will then bring back information to the Maricopa Community Colleges related to any curriculum that's going through the process. So it's really helping us in terms of being responsive and then also acting accordingly in terms of any decisions related to curriculum or transfer that might have impact on our students. And the next. And then um, just to share with you, um, the Maricopa Community Colleges, I'm very proud to say, is that we developed a transfer inventory. And this is a self-assessment that an institution can go through to ask their questions and their key stakeholders in terms of how are we structured? What is the awareness around transfer? What are the perceptions? And then how are we organized to support university transfer and transfer students? And so it's a transfer inventory that an institution can have a conversation with their um, key stakeholders, and then it generates a conversation. And then it also elevates any gap areas that the institution may have in support of university transfer. So that's just to give you a snapshot of what those categories are, and maybe some of the questions that are underneath um, category. And then next. And then I'll pass it off to my colleague, um, Eileen. Hello, everyone. My name is Eileen Strumpel, and just a delight and an honor to be here. And I always learn so much from, from Rose, so it's a hard, hard act to follow, but I'll, I'll try to do what I can, um, if you don't mind forwarding to the next slide. I really um, wanted to focus really specifically on some of the different levels of connection and communication. Um, you know, I think it's uh, it's one of those many situations where it's both top down as well as bottom up. And when both are working, that's when transfer really comes to life. Um, and, you know, there's the, we have the leaders, we have the faculty that are really um, trying to, you know, thinking of curriculum and what they're teaching. But most of all, we're all here because of the students and trying to foster their success. Um, but I also really wanted to highlight um, as 
uh, with incredible importance, uh, a real key facilitator, a, a real linchpin to this communication, which is that transfer and articulation officer. And I know that uh, that Steve and Rose and I have all served in that position. We understand um, the real importance that that role plays in terms of making sure that everyone's on the same page. So um, moving to the next slide. Um, you know, when you were talking about communication that the top level, I think is really important, right? We've got, whether it's a, a president or the chancellor or the provost, the dean, um, it almost doesn't matter, but that's the person who's really providing an overarching vision. How important is this partnership? Um, and that, and to be able to set the tone that this is an important part of how, who we are as an institution. This is a core value that we have but also importantly that that, that, that uh, academic leader has the authority to really say, you know, we're gonna go ahead with an agreement. It may be the chief articulation officer who actually does the work to figure out how that works out, but it's, it's that leader that says, I want to invest the institution's time, money and energy to make an agreement possible. And that they bring the resources to bear to make that happen. And this is also key that they have the power to incentivize faculty, right? And, and faculty is, you know, we, I, I'm a faculty member myself. Uh, many of you are out there this morning um, that, you know, there's, there's limited time. And so unless we really understand that it's important to our leadership, unless we're incentivized to, to, um, to really make this happen, uh, sometimes it just doesn't get done. Um, so it, that, that power to incentivize faculty is so key, um, but it's important. Symbolic power is really important as well to be able to say as, that um, as institutions that are funded by our government, that we have a, an obligation to serve our people, um, our citizens, um, that's a really important um, heart message to send to people. Um, and I don't think that that can be underestimated that this, the power of transfer um, really is um, beautifully articulated by the power that we all have, no matter what our role here um, this morning, to really influence the lives of people, to improve individuals' lives, but importantly, to, to move society along, that there's a collective gift that we all have. And last but not least, those presidents really bring um, a sense of, of a bridging, right? They're, they're, um, I love that with uh, here in Los Angeles, I'm, I'm friends with the presidents of the community colleges and that we, we call each other up if something's not working, if there's a question, um, you know, that, that there's that comfort level that, um, you know, our teams will be the ones that, that actually make it work, that, that make it, that operationalize it, if you will. But it's that, it's that relationship that, that we all have, that shared commitment to transfer um, that, that really also makes it important um, in term, that's important in terms of success. Uh, so if you don't mind moving to the next slide. I, faculty, um, you know, maybe it's different in another idyllic part of the world, but I kind of doubt it. Um, any uh, place I've been, you know, faculty, and, and I chose this image in particular here at UCLA, um, you know, we can have this, um, you know, a sense of uh, elitism, right, as a, you know, a really top tier public institution. But what does that mean when we're dealing with our transfer partners? Well, sometimes faculty can have a lack of trust for their um, faculty members at community colleges. They don't, necessarily believe that the quality of those classes at the community colleges is the same. Although I've had people on my own uh, leadership cabinet say, actually, if we're honest, I think those classes might be better taught at the community college because those are folks who actually spend a lot of time and energy thinking about their pedagogy and how they teach. And maybe those classes might be better. Right. I mean, so there's some of these things are these these um, this communication issues don't necessarily aren't based in reality, but but I think to not talk about them it does us all a disservice. Um, so in there, there is that kind of lack of respect on, on both sides, right? Um, they, perhaps the community college faculty feel that their teaching prowess, which 
maybe you are much better than the ones that you might find at a four-year institution, don't feel respected for the amount of time and energy they spend in their pedagogy. Um, and uh, at the four-year institution, um, there's an idea that those courses somehow don't measure up. Um, but where this all like kind of brings rubs hard is when we're all doing our work, which is trying to find ways of aligning curriculum so our students can move from a two-year institution to a four-year institution. So to, it's important, I think, to, to recognize these issues so that you can talk about them. But then what do we do in terms of moving that conversation forward? And so here to move to the next slide. Um, some, I think it's important, and, and here you'll see a, a current UCLA student, uh, Moses Aubrey, on the stage at LA Community College. So it's by shared events, shared, um, shared connections, right? And so thinking about um, bringing together the faculty, the family, the students, the staff, around the discipline they love, whether that's physics or engineering or math or music, it doesn't even matter, right? But just bringing people together because they have a shared love for that discipline. And when they see those shared students succeed, whether that's in a poster presentation or a stunning cello performance that I, I still weep when I see Mosas here, um, you know, that really brings people together. They really understand that it, that student success was our shared faculty success. We together made that possible. Um, and another thing that kind of brings it home, and I, I, sh I share this with you um, with all humbleness, is sharing a lot of data. Um, you know, that there is kind of an, uh, a sense, a, a wonder, I think, uh, on skepticism. Is this a viable pathway? Is this the best pathway? Does this work? And by sharing both with our community college partners, as well as with our own faculty and um, uh, the data, like these are success stories. These are students whose lives we touched and transformed. They're, they're having a successful short time to degree. They're graduating. They're having their lives and the lives of their families transformed. That's where you really start to get people's hearts going. And so I, I think it's both, um, the mind with the data and the heart together coming, coming together that, that really captures the, the soul of the potential of transfer. Um, if you don't mind moving to the next slide. And, and here I think uh, was a, a statement by one of our faculty members that, that really I think ties that together. It's you know, really thinking about, um, I began to realize in a new way that UCLA is a public institution and funded by our government, ostensibly to educate all of our citizens. And here she, it was a she, she um, acknowledged a, a truth, right? Most transfer students didn't have all the advantages and she meant like wealth and power and family position coming into UCLA. So they really deserved more than anyone else, this extra effort and chance for me. So this was someone who, when you really showed the data that they're coming from families who have less advantage, who have less money, who didn't have all the opportunities, um, that it really, the data and their heart came together and really took a, a transfer skeptic and really converted her into a transfer champion. So that was, that was a real beautiful, um, beautiful moment for me. Um, wanted to move on to the to the in, to the communication about student to student and here um, you know it is institution to students I really um, you know it's the institutional framework that makes it possible but ultimately it's really the students to students that, that were um, I hate to say it I'm, I'm old and not that interesting um, but the students love to talk to each other and so um, we have, uh, we call them transfer troubadours, right? They're singing the songs about UCLA and how fabulous it is. And they hold webinars and chat office hours and you know, answer emails. And, and that's a huge part, right? And, and sometimes I think that they'll ask another um, near peer a question that maybe they wouldn't ask um, someone they might see as an adult um, or a, a staff member, so that there's a level of trust there that I think is so important. Um, I also think it's really um, key to address the financial components. Um, and 
for us in the United States, uh, trans uh, coming from a two-year community college, the tuition is much lower. And so there's often a, a sticker shock of, wow, it costs a lot more to go to that four-year institution. And so it's really important for four-year institutions to, to put some money on the table, to have scholarships that are only eligible for, that only transfer students are eligible for, and that we advertise those opportunities. And we really show how those transfer pathways are not just visible and viable, but they're actually fiscally possible, right? It's a big leap for, for folks to make. And um, you gotta kind of, we have this saying in the United States, I don't, I don't know if this translates well, you put your money where your mouth is. And by that, um, we mean like, if you're saying something, you're saying transfer is important, that you wanna put money behind that. And I think that's really important. Um, and I think also, again, this kind of turns back to that peer to peer, um, having dedicated uh, services for transfer students, whether, you know, either um, audition days or admitted student days, but you're, you're really thinking of a, a dedicated services to them. We think about that for our regular first year students and transfer students can't be an afterthought. They, they need their own tailored experience. They're bringing a lot of different experiences to the table. Um, and, and we need to be mindful of that and, and meet them where they are. Um, if you continue on to the next slide, that I think this is uh, oftentimes underestimated and that's the importance of having um, a campus, I, I call it, we call it a proactively welcoming ecosystem. That's a lot of fancy words. What does that really mean? It just means like, let's have a campus that actually welcomes transfer students, helps them see themselves, helps them feel welcome, helps them feel at home. Um, and that really starts from day one, right? As soon as they're admitted, you have a, a tailored transfer student orientation. And again, it's not led by the old folks like me, but it's really led by our current students who are, who are transfer students themselves, right? So automatically you see like, oh, here's a person who's just a year or two farther along in the journey. They did it. I can see myself doing it too. It's possible. Um, and we also make sure that there's a support network so that transfer students have a regular affinity group. And um, as leaders, it's important to provide food, uh, free food. Students always show up for free food. Um, and, uh, you know, welcoming them, right? Even having the leader, again, whether that's your, your chancellor, your president, your dean, um, having a special welcome, really being intentional about how important it is and how much it means to have them uh, at, at, at home at your institution. And, and I think those gestures can't, can't be underestimated. Um, and if you move along to the next slide here, um, I touched on this a little bit in the beginning. And again, this is a role that, that all three of us have played, but um, that chief articulation officer, I, I was kind of giggling, um, but it, it really is, uh, and the image there is kind of fun, right? They're the heralds. They're, they're literally singing out the songs. They're giving the warnings. They're their chief communication officer. And that's at all different levels, right? For the institutions that we're all at, you know, it's really making sure that those agreements are updated, the courses are updated, um, and importantly, keeps the leaders um, apprised of what's going on, if there's any issues. Um, on that faculty level, um, they're, they're really facilitators of curricular changes. And by this, I mean that they're actually, if, they're, if there's a really good um, uh, chief articulation officer, even when they hear about a new degree program uh, being created or uh, a new change that might be happening, they'll automatically kind of raise their hand and say, hey, but how does this articulate? How do we transfer this? Or how are we gonna count that? Um, so they're always there to be, help us be mindful. They're really like the transfer champions that make it all possible. Um, and they really do that in a way not after the new course has already passed or after the new degree is already put through, but this is a key word in advance, right? They're the ones that are kind of saying, hey, think about this, think about the actions and how they, how they may influence what's going on. Um, and at the student level, boy, they are just that point of contact for students. And, um, you know, they 
will uh, obviously know if they're really good at what they're doing. They'll know the advisors at different community colleges. They'll be able to call the head advisor and connect to students. They'll be able to really kind of keep all the trains running. So I can't, um, I can't underestimate the importance of having a chief articulation officer, but then empowering them to really be a chief communication officer. And I, and I know you have some, some wonderful leaders here. And then I just wanted to um, close this part uh, of the conversation um, by really thinking about communication at the end of the day is the foundation to good, solid, fabulous collaboration and at the end of the day, that equals transfer student success. And, and that I, I just wanted to share with you a, a couple of quotes and, um, that, uh, that people have found in, in the community college that yes, there's a lot of obstacles um, that could prevent them, but if we're all communicating and all collaborating, we can help on the early rate. We can help take away those obstacles and, um, uh, at UCLA, the founder of the School of Music, um, Herb Alpert, um, said he just loves that um, education is just this avenue for self-improvement and, and loves the community college connection, loves the idea that no matter what the background of the students, that as institutions funded by our government, that we really can transform the lives of our students um, and our communities. Um, and with that, I wanted to give a shameless plug uh, on the next slide for uh, let you know about uh, the book that Steve Handel and I just uh, released um, just last month, uh, Beyond Free College, and really talking about how do we all meet the, the needs of, of today's students? How do, we, how do we think about not just getting the students through the door, um, but how do we really get them, how do we foster getting their degrees? Um, so it's not just access for our students, it's really about success. Um, and I know you're all here tonight um, or this morning looking to do that exact same thing. Um, and uh, the last slide, I'll pass it off to uh, back to Steve Handel to talk a little bit about the transfer experience here too. No, I'll pass it along to Rose. So, so both of us have been involved in the transfer experience, which is another new book that's out. And for many of you who are thinking about transfer and thinking about um, what that means for your institution, institution, this might be a this might be a good resource for you. But Rose, what would you say? Um, I really enjoyed being part, um, dedicating and contributing a book chapter um, because it really does take a different lens to the transfer experience. Um, through the chapters, you'll read that there's an equity focus in terms of focusing on different populations of students and really honing in on strategies to support them, as well as the adult learner. How can we better service um, adult learners who are a little maybe intimidated to go back um, and pursue their education? So um, it was released in February, so all the information is timely. So I was just really proud to be part of that process. Thanks, Steve. I was as well. Yeah, it was a great, great process. Well, with that, we're going to turn to some questions. And I, and I know that, um, uh, uh, well, I promised you a treat and you, and you received it. You have a couple of uh, the very best in the USA uh, who are focusing on transfer from two important perspectives from community colleges and um, and from, from the university. Um, but I, I wanted to drill a little bit deeper into some of the issues that you raised there. So here's a question for you. So our colleagues who are, are listening to us right now, um, in many instances, are just beginning this process. They're, they're just thinking about how they build communication between whatever institution they're at and the one that they want their students to go to or that they want to draw students from. We gave them an awful lot of information, but what's the, what's the underlying theme to all this? What's the first thing they ought to be thinking about um, when they're thinking about improving transfer? Uh, well, I'll take a first stab, but I'm from the four-year side at UCLA, and then Rose, maybe you'll uh, chime in. Um, I, I would say that the most that one of the key takeaways for me, and I've always been humbled by this, is um, really the the two leaders at the institutions, the the four-year and the two-year, deciding it's important, and then each of them designating a chief articulation officer 
that as I said, really is the chief communication officer, someone that's empowered to make decisions, to communicate, to facilitate, that that, that role and its importance cannot be underestimated, especially when I was thinking about all of you at the earlier stages, like what are some of the key foundational components that's really number one, because um, a, a really great chief articulation officer can make the world sing. And I'll use a, a musical metaphor there. Um, really, that, that that's so important to have that person in place and empowered. Rose, what would yeah, you say? And I, I would like to add that it's always, um, I think where we started was we identified our allies and advocates, those who were truly mm. passionate about supporting transfer students and already were on board about wanting to improve the experience and really focused on um, meeting the needs of transfer students. Um, how we get to it is um, we were able to develop surveys. Um, so we really survey our students to see where we can make process improvements and how we could better communicate um, those outcomes to our university partners so that we could address um, whatever issues. Um, and then I also really feel that um, you may have some skeptics and those who uh, may not be on board and we need them at the table as well um, and really try to build that foundation based off of trust and transparency. So I think it's really just kind of um, finding the coalition of the willing um, to do the work and it takes a lot of work uh, to be able to develop the policies, the systems, and then the mechanisms to be able to support strategic collaboration and communication. Let's talk for a minute about faculty to faculty communication, because uh, certainly where, where we sit, but I think also around the world, faculty are obviously key. They're the, they're the teachers, they're the researchers, um, but oftentimes, um, uh, faculty at two-year institutions and faculty at four-year institutions simply don't have opportunities to talk to one another. How do you facilitate that? What do you What do you do? How do you get them together? Because they're, I think they're going to be key. Would you Would you agree? I think they're. Um, we base our curriculum and our articulation by a faculty-driven model. It has to be driven by faculty in order for that trust, those standards, to be established. Um, it's easy, um, Steve, in the beginning, when we first started 20 years ago, it was quite challenging because of the mm -hmm. issues that Eileen had shared. But our faculty now, they look forward to those conversations. They look forward to meeting with their colleagues, whether it's once a year or twice a year, to share information. It could be about textbooks. It could be about the latest research or projects that they're working on, the grants that they're part of. Um, so we went from this kind of, you know, um, deficit-based um, experience to now asset, like what could we bring to the table that we could share, that we could benefit from having these conversations. So it, it is a lot easier than it was um, back in the early days. And I just want to um, emphasize what, what Rose had said, that it, it will be really hard at first. I think it's, it's, um, uh, it's hard to overestimate the, the faculty lack of trust. Um, and it does take time. And don't feel that you're doing something wrong if it doesn't happen instantaneously. It, trust is, a, is built over a period of time. But I have found in a variety of institutional contexts that when you build those, um, those times for faculty to come together, um, it's key to be building it around the students. So rather than, especially in the beginning, rather than just bringing faculty together to talk about curriculum, which can automatically start at a fraught or, or complicated, challenging place, if you bring them together because there's a shared research symposium where everyone's showing research posters and people see the student success or a concert of shared students um, where again they can actually see the impact of the possibilities of that collaboration it, it softens their heart 
Um, and so then when you go to have the harder conversation around the textbook, around the different learning objectives for various classes that people are, are willing to, to, are to talk to each other and the, the walls slowly come down. Um, so I think taking the time to actually plan those first, especially those for, in those first early years, um, how that you're how you're bringing the faculty together, to to bring them together around something that's going to touch their heart, um, it, before you go right to the intellectual part about arguing about the courses. I was has, also has taken, really... but I sorry, uh, but I was also no, taken no, by your point earlier about the shared love of the passion, because I know Ken and I have talked, I mean, yeah. part of this, I'm not in a school of nursing, but school of nursing is part and parcel of what a lot of folks here are, are thinking about, and they have this shared knowledge, this shared discipline. Is that also an avenue? Because you, you spoke to that in your talk earlier, in terms of music with the community college. It is, and, and so for nursing to, you know, have people, um, coming around a simulation lab and talking about the possibilities and different things, you know, are talking about, you know, shared successes, um, you know, those types of disciplinary uh, conversations that, that, you know, engender, um, you know, conversation because people love nursing, right? That's why they're still at the university because they, they, they never really left <laughs> and, um, and they love to study. And that's why we're all still in a certain sense, although we're faculty and administrators or staff, that, that we're also still perpetual students. And that kind of excites that almost childlike hope. Um, and that's a great place to start these harder conversations. So I couldn't agree more, Steve. I've got one last question and then Ken will throw it open to the larger group so that they have a chance to ask questions as well. But Rose, well, for both of you actually, so what does success look like? In other words, what does success from where you sit in these transfer affirming cultures look like? So when everything is said and done and you've done all your hard work, um, how do you measure that? What are you looking for in your jobs in this work? Yeah, I will begin with, it really comes down to engagement, right, from all levels. Um, our faculty just want to be engaged in the conversation. They want to be part of it. Um, you know, they're the stewards of their disciplines. They're the content experts, and they very well should be the drivers in terms of um, curriculum development and an articulation. So I think for them, what success looks like for them or how they would define uh, a successful model is that they are um, key leaders as part of the process and driving it and making those decisions. And so um, for students, I will go back to on one of the slides is we do do student surveys because it's very important, um, like Eileen had indicated, data is great and we do that, we collect that. And, um, but that tells one side of the story that tells numbers and GPAs and um, you know, some success, but then also hearing from student voices, whether it's um, through focus groups or through surveys in terms of how satisfied were they with their transfer experience. And that's where I feel the most, um, um, the, the most inspired by those voices because these transfer students will complete a survey to help other transfer students. I mean, they literally will tell us if I can help somebody um, to either avoid this or to take advantage of this, then this you know, survey, we don't you know, pay students to do surveys or incentivize them, um, but they will fill it, up, fill it out. For me as a, a professional, the fact that I just get to be part of these conversations and then also have some influence and impact in terms of what the transfer agenda looks like and being able to shape, shape that, um, that success for me. And I would just, um, I, 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 yes, <laughs> Rose, exactly. Um, I, I would just add to that, you know, I, for me, it's, it's partly the numbers. Um, and so I'm happy at UCLA that this fall, it looks like we'll have doubled the number of transfer students in two years. So that's huge progress for, for a school that hasn't, doesn't have a great history with the transfer. Um, and here I'll just be honest and say that we're still working on the culture. Um, UCLA is a very um, 
it can, can be a very elitist institution. And so transfer students don't always feel at home. Even once they get through the door, it's a big culture shock. There's a big transfer shock. And um, I, I'm still working on that with, with the welcomes and with transfer support networks and peer to peer. But I'm part of a larger institution and it has its own culture and that's still really rough. So I, um, I, you know, I, I don't think it's helpful to only share the successes. I wanted to also be intentional about um, sharing a, a point of continued pain and something that, that I'm still working on um, uh, in the hopes that, that you'll tell me I'm not alone. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, as I did, I promised you a treat, and I think I think they've come through. Ken, I want to turn it back to you uh, for questions and answers, perhaps from the audience. But thank you again for this opportunity. It's been great fun. Yeah, thank you so much for three of you again. Uh, so, without saying anything, I think there's one already say something. <laughs> so may I take this opportunity to sit you advice how to? Oh, let me see that. Yeah. So in the chat box, there's a questions. Okay, uh, how do community college and university establish a formal communication channel at first? And who played the role to line up both sides? Okay, in your past experience. Wow, great question. Yeah. I could go ahead and jump start. in. Um, Please do. That, that was my previous role. I was the yeah. district director for university transfer. And so I was the point of contact for all 10 colleges. So you could probably go to any one of our colleges. And if you mention articulation, university transfer or partnership, they would direct you to me. And so that's where we would go. We would take them through the process, whether it's the application, um, the criteria, we would share those, uh, that information with them um, prior to even um, thinking about establishing an agreement um, because we do have um, high expectations from our university partners. Um, but university transfer is housed in our academic affairs um, area, which is our, our faculty side, instructional side of the house. So when we enter into agreement, our chief academic officer or our provost is the person that signs it. So organizationally, we're set up where it goes through academic affairs, it's signed, and then we work with student affairs and marketing and communication to be able to do the implementation steps. And I would say that for, for institution to institution level agreements, it's just as Rose um, are, uh, shared that it really is that provost or chief academic officer um, for uh, if it's a school uh, that's disciplinary specific like nursing and, and Ken, I'm looking right at you. Um, oftentimes it's just the Dean. You don't even, you don't need to involve the, the provost. It can be Dean to Dean um, level agreement. So, um, it, I, and that's a beautiful place to start and sometimes a little bit easier because um, the folks who are really caring and the folks who know the students and the curriculum um, most intimately are, have their hands. Uh, right on it. So um, I, but it has to be intentional, kind of, right? Has to be intentional, and it has to have that level of, of of support, or it's hard to sustain. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, to follow up uh, Latham's uh, questions, um, because I think uh, from Steve in the first webinar and also this second webinar, uh, there's one officer has been repeatedly mentioned. Uh, in the webinars, that is the transfer or articulation officer. So because in the current uh, situation in Hong Kong, we don't have this role. So just like Rose mentioned that like you are the kind of a, have a specific role before that you are, you are doing the transfer, but in Hong Kong right now, we don't have such mm. a person or role. So how we start to have that or uh, what should we do? I think that's your. I think that's your role, Ken. <laughs> I, think, yeah, but, I think you've just been anointed. You've been anointed. <laughs> you know, even in some places, I mean, you're right. I mean, we have like designated articulation office for for which is 100 percent of their time. But in many places, at least outside of California, it's it's oftentimes a faculty person who's who's part of their role is to to handle this. Now that may be too much for any given faculty person. I agree, mm -hmm. but sometimes if you start small, at least you you have someone develop that expertise on campus who can at least have 
uh, that to be able to present and to be and, and to be able to to advance that work. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, before I ask for the questions, see whether audience have any other questions. Yeah, I think um, we our audience come from uh, community college and also university or other capacities. Um, yeah, so see whether they have any further questions. Please feel free to just uh, turn on your microphone or uh, write something in the chat box. See, I think there's a lot of hurdles. I, I think it's, uh, at least for me, I'm glad to hear that like we are not alone. <laughs> yeah, even- Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so after like uh, Steve's last time mentioned 60 years, right? So uh, yeah, a long history of struggling and a strive for the success. Um, but we, you, I can hear that you still have some uh, issues, the cultures. Like, I think that's what yeah. we need to do in Hong Kong as well. Yeah, the change the culture. Yeah, so, um, okay. So uh, audience, please feel free to just jump in to ask questions. I know that the time is uh, already one hour, but just feel free to stay and also uh, ask further questions. Uh, my question is that um, uh, you mentioned that like um, the, uh, actually uh, the articulation office or whatever the name is, okay? Because I think in our in the Hong Kong situation, I think it's the program leader. So we have a like a program and then uh, the mm. program leader uh, will be playing similar role, I think. Mm. Yeah, so like for example, for me in our university in nursing, that I'm the program leader for the nursing program uh, for the transfer student, the program. So I will work with the community college and like that. And community college, there's a uh, program leader as well uh, that uh, that might be able to articulate to our nursing yeah. program. Like something like that, like music maybe, and also business and engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, each program have a program leader. So um, I heard that like from the community college, uh, they often said that it seems the, uh, the power or the initiation should come from university, seems like that. But I'm very glad to hear that Rose, you uh, from the community college actually play a, a lot of uh, efforts and uh, uh, they initiate a lot of uh, different activities as well to, uh, to, to make the articulation success and also the student success as well. So uh, I'm thinking is that like for the audience right now, if you are come from the community college or in Hong Kong, we call some degree institution. I think uh, you can do a lot of work as well. Not, not like waiting for the degree <laughs> university to do something. Uh, is that again, Rose uh, share some of your uh, experience and yeah, I think it's um, very important. Um, the community colleges um, play a very um, unique role. It's a very um, uh, critical role in higher education um, because we do intake a lot of students. So we're also a transfer institution. So we have students transferring into us. We have you know people who are returning. We have high school students. So we're in some ways a receiving institution as well. So we really need to, to make sure that we had those processes in place to be able to intake um, that learning um, seamlessly. Uh, so it really improved our processes, but you're very correct in terms of, we took a proactive approach because we were limited in the resources and the individuals that we had. So we had to do things smarter um, in, in terms of how we organize. And that's the reason why I wanted to focus on organization in, in terms of being able to scale and sustain these efforts uh, because it could be um, overwhelming at first. And so I think it's really identifying what your priorities are um, in year one and maybe doing some short-term goals and then building out from there in terms of building on that progress and leveraging that success. So I think that the community colleges are actually um, a leader and a driver in terms of how the universities respond. So to give you an example, I'm leading a statewide effort related to prior learning assessment. So again, mm -hmm. all of that 
non-traditional learning outside the classroom and how do you translate that to college credit? Um, so it's really the community colleges who are pushing the universities to get on board because we're seeing the students in a large number, um, in large numbers because they're returning back to us because of the pandemic or because they're displaced in their careers. And so it's really, you know, incumbent of us to figure out solutions and how we serve them. And then ultimately how they can take that credit and then transfer. So lots of, lots of opportunities, untapped potentials related to the role that we play in higher education. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm watching the time, so uh, I think some of the uh, participants probably need to leave and something like that. So uh, may I take this opportunity, thanks to of you, uh, our very, very honest speakers. Uh, I'm you. sure that whatever information you provide to us will uh, give us a, 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 a lot of information to discuss in our uh, next local section on this topic. And then we will see okay. you again, okay, uh, for the agreement, that section. Yeah, okay. So All I right. have uh, to do some, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, okay. So please stay behind. So I have to do some uh, uh, some work that we will do after this uh, uh, webinar. So we would like to invite the audience, the participant to fill in a uh, survey. Okay, questionnaire, <laughs> data again. <laughs> so uh, this is will help us to improve and also uh, in the future webinar, uh, how we can do better. Yeah, and uh, so please fill in uh, this uh, 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 feedback questionnaire. And also we will provide the uh, participant with a certificate. Uh, so uh, hopefully we, you send your own questionnaire uh, feedback, then we will send you also the, the certificate as well. <laughs> Okay, so uh, and also we will upload as a, 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 a thank you very much for the three speakers uh, to uh, their kindness to share their PowerPoint. So uh, we will upload it uh, to the, our uh, website uh, once it's ready and also uh, upload this uh, webinar. Uh, we have uh, recorded already, so we will upload it as well to our uh, resource website once it's ready. Okay, so um, to promote our next webinars, uh, we will have, uh, I think it will be um, almost close to uh, end of uh, May, okay. So, and then we will have our third, okay, webinars. So uh, we will also invite uh, three of you to come to, to share your experience and uh, uh, all those uh, useful information that help us to use in locally about the MOU uh, next time, okay? I think it's in May 26th, okay, May 26th, yeah. Okay, yeah, so- We're uh, all just doing so, what you tell us to, Kim. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> as it come from Daniel, okay? So uh, anyway, so uh, uh, we will have the new promotion again. So thank you very much for the audience and uh, uh, your time. Uh, please feel free to send us your question uh, because uh, uh, in May 26, uh, our three speaker will be here again, so we can further uh, answer those questions if you have any after this uh, webinar. So thank you very much. Okay. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank but if you, you have well. any, if you have any question, you can stay behind. Then uh, because our speaker will will be here for a while, so we'll see whether you have any further questions. So thank you again for all of you. And thanks for Ali, Rose, and also Steve. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much.